den Angeklagten so weit sie in meinem Blickfeld lagen, die ersten militärischen Berater Hitlers, ließ mir die Weiterführung. Schmidt remains unchanged. The Nazi centre in Schusdal Camp 160 operated under General Schmidt, former Chief of Staff of 6th Army and some other generals actively participated. Many prisoners of war in the camp were obviously still afraid of Schmidt. In any case, they clearly preferred that he knew as little as possible about their conversations with Soviet officers. Schmidt probably influenced Polis as they often talked in private. After his return home in the post-war years, Schmidt was engaged in commercial affairs in Hamburg. He always remained true to Nazi revanchist ideas. Schmidt was the only general who was always dissatisfied with something. He deliberately sought cause for endless annoying and arrogant complaints. For a whole week, for example, he grumbled that porridge from millet, oats or groats was served along with meat dishes. We are neither chickens nor horses, he shouted. And, whilst visiting the camp, representatives of the commission from Moscow witnessed one of his jokes. He suddenly neighed loudly like a horse. It's from the oatmeal, he explained with a mockery. And soon I'll be screaming like a rooster from the millet. Apparently he wanted to give his subordinates an example of personal courage and wit. In fact, Schmidt's activities were much more serious and thorough. One must pay tribute where it is due. He did not mind hard work. He led the fight against anti-fascist influences both practically and ideologically. For days on end he sat behind books, studying the classical works of Marx and Lenin, the speeches of Stalin, making notes and extracts. Cunningly interpreting separate excerpts in his own way, inventively, but not always logically, Schmidt tried to give a theoretical justification for his own demagogic works. But he did not succeed. Obviously, the general did not have enough philosophical knowledge. His eclecticism in reasoning, his lack of experience of politics, and overall clumsiness of what he postulated prevented him achieving any credible outcome. He was, however, more successful in practical propaganda. At his direction, a new truth on the Battle of Stalingrad spread among junior officers and soldiers. It explained that this battle was only a separate isolated episode of defeat, which is inevitable in any major war. Moreover, it was claimed that the battle on the Volga had no serious consequences and will not have any. This was widely believed, maybe because the prisoners wanted to believe, or maybe it was due to Schmidt's ability to present facts in an acceptable way to his listeners. The former Chief of Staff of Sixth Army did not for a moment doubt the final victory of Nazi Germany. He spoke with contempt about von Brauschitsch and Bock, who lost time in the winter of 1941. Schmidt was also the main obstacle to those generals and officers who were tempted to join the anti-fascist meetings. Around Schmidt grouped the most notorious Nazis. First of all, General Heitz. Before leaving to the front, Heitz was chairman of the German military tribunal. He was a fierce soldier of the old Prussian military. In the 8th Army Corps that he commanded in the Stalingrad cauldron, dozens of soldiers and officers were shot at his behest. General Roska also continued to advocate loyalty to the Führer. This lean, grey-haired man was appointed Major General in the last days of the encirclement at Stalingrad. He had been the first to reach the Volga in the city centre a few months earlier as commander of the 194th Infantry Regiment. 
see the related video. And now he spoke with venomous contempt of his colleagues that read the newspaper for prisoners of war or attended lectures organized by the camp's command. General Strecker acted as the executive assistant on the principle order is order. His 11th Army Corps, surrounded in Stalingrad at the tractor factory, continued senseless resistance until February 2, 1943, longer than all other German units, even after 6th Army's command had surrendered. Schmidt and his entourage spread rumours about an upcoming German raid on Suzdal to free them all. They hinted they had a secret channel for communication with the Reich, through which they were informed about preparations for this raid. Of course, these hints were a bluff. Neither Schmidt nor any other of the prisoners of war had any such connections, and the raid on Suzdal was a legend composed by the general himself. Although one such tentative attempt was actually considered, see the previous video, Schmidt had nothing to do with it. He could not know that the officers of the Soviet counterintelligence, Schmirsch, were doing everything possible to prevent contact between the captured generals and the German agents. Paulus does begin to change. Despite the sharp nature of our conversations with Paulus, it was clear to me that the ice of anti-Soviet stereotypes was gradually melting in the mind of the field marshal. In the camp, Paulus regularly got acquainted with the Soviet press. Not knowing the Russian language, he asked me a daily review of Pravda, Izvestia and Red Star newspapers. Then he asked to translate this or that article. Often he mentally returned to what was read to him and expressed his opinion about the article. Once Paulus came across the headline of Pravda for April 9, 1943, which said, the whole of the country is rebuilding Stalingrad. He asked for this to be translated. It's a pity, the field marshal remarked, that I won't be able to see this city with my own eyes. It is written here that Soviet gold miners donated a large amount of the gold they extracted to help rebuilding Stalingrad. This is symbolic, he said. The rivers of blood spilled here and the gold mined for the restoration of this city. Yes, it will be fabulous a bright city on the banks of the Volga. Ten years later, no, twenty years from now, it will rise again, exclaimed the Field Marshal. Another day in June 1943, Paulus read an article by Leonid Pervomaisky entitled Hate. It talked about the Stalingrad worker Pyotr Goncharov, a metal cutter at the Red October plant, who became a sniper during the war. The Nazis murdered Goncharov's entire family, including his four sons. Returning to his village, he found in the ashes of his house an old iron familiar to him from childhood that had not been destroyed by the flames. And the Soviet soldier stood motionless over the iron, the only thing left from his former life. Paulus asked to read this passage twice. He then fell silent. After a while he said, How long will it take to amend for the terrible evil that we brought to this earth? No, it's impossible to redeem because you cannot return the dead children. You can only act so that this never happens again. This will be the task of many future generations. 
Paulus was often surprised by his own lack of knowledge of Russian culture. Once he asked me to translate for him an article on Leningrad, published in Pravda in May 1943. It mentioned brilliant Russian writers and artists, musicians and scientists, generals and architects, whose names were associated with the ancient city. Suvorov and Kutuzov, Ushakov, Makarov, Lomonosov and Pavlov, Pushkin, Gogol, Tchaikovsky and Glinka. But I know almost none of them, said Paulus bitterly. How we were isolated from all Russian culture. Besides Suvorov and Kutuzov, I really don't know anything about anyone. I only heard the music of Tchaikovsky and I know the name of your great poet Pushkin, but I never read anything from him. At the end of June 1943, Paulus read the report of the Soviet Information Bureau on the results of two years of war. Listening to the translation, the field marshal made brief notes in a notebook. He emphasised every conclusion. The Red Army being significantly strengthened. How Soviet production proved its efficiency in the most difficult conditions. The international position of the USSR rising as never before. Paulus was forced to admit that these conclusions correspond to the actual state of things. He expressed doubt only about the conclusion of the crisis in the German homeland and the growth of the resistance movement. This is an exaggeration that can be found in propaganda in every country at war. No, no, I am sure of this. The people continue to follow their Führer. No one dares to fight against him. The Germans are a very obedient nation, accustomed to order. Subtle notes of bitterness showed in his voice. However, it cannot be argued that in the summer of 1943, Paulus already had distinct anti-Nazi thoughts. No, rather at this time he had more a complete conviction of the fallacy of Hitler's command strategy. Once in a conversation with a Soviet general, the German field marshal said, the largest miscalculation of our command is, first, in the fact that we stretched our forces too thin and remained without reserves, and second, our intelligence did not give us a clear idea of what a powerful industrial base Russia had in the East. We did not know that it would be able to provide such quantities of weapons. And my personal miscalculation consisted of the fact that I obeyed unquestioningly. Like a soldier, the order of the supreme command, and immediately contrary to Hitler's will, as soon as we were surrounded, I didn't initiate a breakout. Here I am to blame for my army, the German people, and my conscience. A whole new world opened up for Paulus. As an honest man, he was forced to admit that he had a thoroughly falsified, distorted idea of the Red Army, of the Soviet people, of the whole country. Often something that he read caused him to fall into deep thought. The Conservatives The tactical line of the conservative group of officers who stayed faithful to the Nazi spirit was expressed by Lieutenant General de Bois, Hitler's fellow companion in the First World War. During a meeting between senior officers he said, we continue to be soldiers in captivity here. This is our front. With this in mind, the conservative generals tried to create an impenetrable rampart for anti-Nazi influence among German officers. First of all, they tried to register all those who read Soviet newspapers for prisoners of war, those who attended official reports and lectures at the club, and especially those who spoke with Soviet political workers or with the German communists who came now and again. In order to observe those who were hesitant, dedicated men were assigned by the Nazi underground centre in the camp. They noted all the statements of the prisoners of war and their reaction to reports on the situation. Those found guilty, that is, dubious in their allegiance to the Fuhrer and National Socialism, were called to secret interrogations by the Nazi conspiracy in the camp. They were threatened with a boycott, as well as brutal reprisals upon their return to the homeland. And the famous stigma of a traitor. The conspirators made it clear that they maintained a secret connection with the Reich through secret channels and that families of traitors might be subjected to reprisals in Germany. 
Men were deliberately sent to the meetings held by the camp command in order to ask provocative questions, to launch false rumours, to intimidate those who attended and who conscientiously tried to get the best of it. Every opportunity was used. On one occasion, for example, in the middle of a speech by a German anti-fascist, the lights suddenly went out. And immediately there came loud exclamations from the depths of the dark hall. Traitors, we will hang you all upon returning home, and so on. And a few minutes later, when the light came back on, there reigned exemplary order in the hall. The Nazi center in the camp was not limited to threats and intimidation. It also tried to maintain ideological influences on officers and soldiers. Among the repertoire of harmless chants and ballads of old Germany that were performed by groups of prisoners, there were introduced explicit songs about steadfastness and courage of German warriors. Various anniversaries are celebrated, dates that coincided with such events as Hitler's birthday, the beginning of World War II, the capture of Paris, the surrender of France, and so on. The underground center fought especially hard to preserve the Heil Hitler greeting with the right arm extended. Prisoners of war who refused to respond to such a greeting were intimidated and insulted. The Progressives However, apart from the Conservatives, there were also Progressives in the camp. We need to digest Stalingrad, said former regimental commander Colonel Steidler. This fearless officer of the battlefield was a soft-witted, humane and thoughtful man. He was seriously ill in the first weeks of captivity and taken care of by our doctors. Apparently, his anti-Nazi sentiments began even before captivity, and during his illness, as he himself said, one could think and reassess many things. He was often addressed as an arbitrator. Major Kuhlmann, for example, asked for advice on whether to tell Soviet officers that his brother-in-law was a communist and in a concentration camp. And Colonel von Arnsdorf even admitted in a confidential conversation with Steidler that his wife was one-quarter Jewish. Maybe it's worth telling the Russians about this so they will trust me more, Arnsdorf asked. Steidler unequivocally advised, We have no right to count on concessions. Remember how much grief we brought to this people and this country. We can expect no forgiveness, and we must carry our cross to the end. Steidler's authority was high among all groups of prisoners, and it was this highly cultured and respected man who became one of the first senior officers in the camp to join the anti-fascists. After the war, Steidler was Minister of Health of the German Democratic Republic for many years. Here are former opponents in Stalingrad meeting after the war. General Chuikov ready to shake hands with Colonel Steidler, with head bowed. This picture was taken at a ceremony for the founding of the East German Republic in Berlin on 7 October 1949. It shows Otto Grotewohl, the first Prime Minister of the GDR, Vasily Chukov, Supreme Commander of the Soviet occupation troops in Germany and former commander of 62nd Army at Stalingrad, and Leutpold Steidler, German minister and former commander of the 767th Grenadier Regiment, 376th Infantry Division, captured at Stalingrad. Major General Corfus was the former commander of the 295th Infantry Division. He looked more like a teacher than a Wehrmacht general. He read a lot, listened attentively to lectures and speeches, and engaged in conversation with junior officers and soldiers. He generally spoke out little, but it was evident that he was overcome by doubts and, probably, difficult thoughts. He once said that he didn't know any people who, after all that had been done to them, could find in themselves the generosity of being as humane with their prisoners as the Soviet people. After the war, Koffers led historical studies in Eastern Germany and became the author of several books. General von Seidlitz Kurzbach, energetic and tough, looked the exact opposite of Koffers. It was he who pushed for a breakout from the Stalingrad encirclement, contrary to Hitler's orders, so that he was already long engaged in the process of reassessing the events the Sixth Army experienced. In Suzdal, he read a lot of political literature and all the anti-fascist press, 
Zeidlitz and Korfus led a small group of generals in their process of disengagement from Nazism. This too was the case of Generals Latman, who became a minister in the German Democratic Republic after the war, and von Daniels. They clearly disapproved of the arrogant behaviour of Schmidt and many of their other colleagues. Of course, the political views of the first anti-Nazi-minded officers were rather vague, inconsistent and sometimes naive. For example, the group consisted of the former 6th Army Chief of Communications, Colonel Van Hooven, Regimental Commander Major Buchler, Captain Domaschek, and Sea Lieutenant Raya. This progressive group immediately came across a number of serious obstacles put up by senior Nazi officers. The group members were no longer welcome at internal meetings between BRWs and they were ridiculed and abused. Yet other members of the officers came under the influence of this group, joined their meetings and openly spoke about their thoughts. So that despite the difficulties, the number of anti-Nazi or at least open-minded officers increased. The reactionary generals then decided to fight even more actively against this group initiating dissent. One case stands out. During a meeting in the camp, there was a presentation by Colonel Van Hoofen. Calmly and convincingly, he proved the inevitability of defeat against the Soviet Union, the need to save the German people, and to eliminate Hitler as the main cause of the disasters. Van Hoofen concluded, saying, When the great German patriot Moritz Arndt who was in captivity, faced a dilemma, loyalty to the princes or fidelity to the nation. He did not hesitate to answer, down with the princes, long live the fidelity to the people. Most of the men listened with attention to the speaker, but there were also cries, this is betrayal, shame on you in a German uniform. Some of the most fervent Nazi generals spoke in turn. What was said here, they declared, is not worthy of a German officer. We are here in captivity and should not participate in politics. But if we're asked, then we will say that we are faithful to our homeland and to the oath. The audience was uncertain how to react. Many were silent, embarrassingly turned away from each other. There was practically no discussion of Van Hooven's report. It seemed to the initiative group it had been defeated. However, as it proved later, the meeting brought considerable results. From this moment, there was a clearer separation between the Nazi conservatives and the progressives. The National Committee Free Germany and the League of German Officers Whereas the process of change in Field Marshal Paulus was slow, it was significantly faster among some of the other officers. German communists who came from Moscow greatly helped in this process. At meetings held in the summer of 1943 in prisoner of war camps, important resolutions were adopted. They condemned Hitler's criminal policy, calling all honest Germans to join the struggle against the Nazi regime for a free, democratic Germany. The resolution said, Stalingrad opened our eyes. In the encirclement, we realized that Hitler and his minions plunged us and all our people into boundless misfortune. Comrades in the camps, unite to fight against Hitler. Those who today stand apart betray the fatherland. Unite against Hitler and his criminal war. Long live free Germany. It was then decided to create the National Committee of Free Germany. The objective was to create a large organization including anti-fascist groups in all the POW camps. The famous German writer and communist Erich Weinert became one of its leaders. In July 1943, a general conference of German prisoners of war was held in Krasnogorsk with representatives of all POW camps in the USSR. Wilhelm Pieck, chairman of the Communist Party of Germany in exile, delivered a memorable speech calling for the unification of all layers of the German people, the army, the homeland and the prisoners to overthrow the Nazi dictatorship, end the war and create a free and independent Germany. Two months later, several former Sixth Army senior leaders who joined the Free Germany Committee also created the League of German Officers. General von Seidlitz was elected president, whereas General von Daniels, 
Colonel Steidler and Van Hooven were vice presidents. Their program said, We, the surviving generals, officers and soldiers of the 6th Army, are calling out to you to show our motherland and our people the path to salvation. Germany knows what Stalingrad meant to us. We went through fire and hell. We were declared dead, but we were reborn to a new life. We can't keep silent. Like no one else, we have the right to speak, not only for our own behalf, but also on behalf of the comrades who fell at Stalingrad. We do not want the sacrifices of our comrades to be in vain. The bitter lesson learned in Stalingrad forced us to make a choice for ourselves. And now we turn to the people, the soldiers, and above all to the leaders of the army, the officers of Wehrmacht. We have our own destiny in our hands. And how did Field Marshal Paulus prove himself during this period, as other officers began distancing themselves from Hitler's ideology? From what I could note, he carefully observed the behaviour of his colleagues, the senior officers. Outwardly, Paulus remained indifferent to the events taking place in the camp. Just like news about the growing anti-fascist sentiment among prisoners of war located in other camps, it did not seem to worry him. But deep inside, he painfully experienced the process of change. This is how Paulus explained, after the end of the war, the position that he took back then, in the autumn of 1943. Consistent with my role as Army Commander, I did not consider myself entitled, as a prisoner, to intervene in the fate of my fatherland, which would create the appearance of cooperation with the enemies of Germany. Therefore, I did not enter the League of German Officers at this time. I didn't approve of Zeidlitz's statements for the following reasons. 1. The deterioration of the situation at the front could not be a reason for changing our position. On the contrary, it was now important to preserve the unity of our armed forces and people. 2. As prisoners of war, we cannot accurately judge either the political nor the military situation for Germany. 3. It seemed to us that the undermining we were subjected to resembled our own actions in 1917, when the German High Command sought to weaken the Russian front by propaganda in order to dictate to Russia its peace conditions. 4. Finally, we were also obsessed by the legend of the knife in the back, since Germany's defeat in the First World War, which we considered as a betrayal from within the country in 1918. Precisely because we believed that the war could no longer be won, and that it was necessary to get out of it under tolerable conditions, we, as soldiers, condemned the National Committee's actions as allegedly directed against the interests of the German people. We believed that in this situation it was necessary to maintain and strengthen the cohesion between the army and the people. In addition, we believed that the intervention of the prisoners of war in the politics of their country contradicts international customs. I and the generals that supported this point of view adopted a written statement in which we sharply rejected any such attempts at decomposition of our unity and sharply condemned Generals von Zeidlitz, Korfus and Latman as they joined the National Committee of Free Germany. Paulus was the first to sign this document which was called the Memorandum. This caused concern from the camp command. It was decided to speak with Paulus to explain to him that by signing this memorandum he changed his position from a neutral prisoner of war and allowed himself to abuse our kind attitude towards him. These conversations were lengthy and difficult. The Field Marshal recalled, At the insistence of General von Zedlitz, in early September I was transferred to Dubrova's dacha near Moscow for further interrogations. Obviously the aim was to draw me, and thereby the other generals, into the Free Germany League, which would have been a decisive achievement for propaganda. After numerous conversations, which were a thorough test for me, I declared that I personally could not deviate from my point of view, but I promised that I would try to convince the other generals to abandon the defamatory statements on Generals von Zedlitz, Koffers and Latman. This was just the beginning. According to Paulus, the newspaper of the committee Freies Deutschland had a serious influence on him and other generals. He wrote later, 
On the one hand, I could not approve the National Committee, but on the other hand, I did not want to speak out against it either. This kind of decision should be made discreetly by each one, individually. Because of this, the generals no longer held meetings in the camp. Among them were individuals who continued to ardently oppose the National Committee. But there were others, including me, who were now eyeing this, but refraining, however, from joining it. The views of the captured Field Marshal gradually changed. Unlike many of his colleagues, Paulus unconditionally recognised the historical significance of the Battle of Stalingrad and the greatness of the military feat accomplished by the Red Army and the Soviet people. In the Pravda newspaper of June 21, 1943, Paulus heard the phrase, In the entire world the name of Stalingrad is connected with the triumph of historical justice. He then said, In my opinion, in this world, justice exists only in nature. In human society it is difficult to find, but as a symbol of the feat of your people and army, the word Stalingrad of course will go down in history forever. This is undeniable. One day this same month, Paulus asked me if we were studying the history of ancient Greece in Soviet universities, and, receiving an affirmative answer, he said, Do you remember the Spartan King Leonidas, who sacrificed himself and 300 of his soldiers in the hopeless, from a military point of view, Battle of Thermopylae? The role of King Leonidas was intended for me. That is why Hitler awarded me the rank of Field Marshal at the end of the fighting in the cauldron. But the leader miscalculated. Instead of Thermopylae, it turned out this was Khan. And this is another drama. Our news agency claims that I always had two pistols on me and an ampule with quick poison during my stay in the cauldron. But I remained alive and surrendered in full consciousness. Only people who did not live through Stalingrad can be surprised at this. Those who were there have become wiser and decades older. Slowly, but noticeably, the mood and behaviour of the captured Field Marshal began to change. Paulus ceased evading conversations with the members of the German Officers League, with the leaders of the National Committee Free Germany, and with the Soviet people. By the end of 1943, he already recognised that Germany could not achieve victory in the war, and believed that only an immediate peace could save Germany from complete defeat and occupation. And then he wondered, would the Soviet government and the allies of the USSR agree to conclude a peace with a man like Hitler? Certainly not. The conclusion inevitably followed. In order to save Germany, Hitler must be eliminated. And yet, as could be judged by his behaviour, in the autumn of 1943, Paulus was still under intense internal struggle. He occasionally shared his thoughts. Once, during a walk, the field marshal told me, if it were not for the Führer's whim, then my whole fate would have turned out differently. After all, in June of 1942, I was about to become Chief of Staff of the Supreme High Command of the Wehrmacht. General Jodl was to leave and I was to take his place. So I should have been sitting in a deep bunker at home instead of wandering along the roads of Russia. But what hindered your appointment? I asked. Paulus chuckled. Hitler hesitated, saying, no matter how important this post is, Stalingrad is even more important. Let's finish the Stalingrad case first. And Keitel supported these considerations of Hitler. He never wanted to see me in the general staff. Do you consider Keitel an experienced commander? You can't say what kind of commander he is. He did not command fighting units, but he knows very well how to navigate through mines in his own house. And Keitel broke a peculiar record. He is the holder of the largest number of highest awards. But you, Field Marshal, are you not the recipient of the highest honours as well? It doesn't matter to me anymore. Field Marshal Paulus no longer exists. If you win, then I'm unlikely to return to my homeland. And if I go back, it will be as a useless invalid, a broken old man. If we win, then your people will kill me they will not allow me to return to the Reich. The same fate will befall all of my comrades, and I think, in general, the majority of prisoners of war. Why do you think so? 
After all, we treat you humanely. You live in good conditions. You are respected. Yes, it's true. It will change in only one case, if Germany wins. But I believe in that very little now. As a major military leader with extensive experience in the general staff, Paulus understood well the significance of the German defeats at Kursk and Oriol in the summer of 1943. He drew some diagrams in his notebook which, apparently, were understandable only to him alone. A large sheet of paper was all covered with arrows, icons, numbers, question marks and abbreviations. Every day, after reading the bulletin of the Soviet Information Bureau, Paulus approached the large map that hung in the library and examined it for a long time through the magnifying glass. Then he went to his room and made notes. In a notebook were the words Lioro, Loxo, Xurk, written in Latin letters and enclosed in large circles. It was easy to guess that these were the names of the Soviet cities written in reverse, Oriol, Oskol, Kursk. The rectangles put forward on either side of the line obviously meant Soviet and German troops. From each rectangle an arrow pointed to some kind of calculation. When asked what the notebook was, Paulus answered, Bored without staff work. I'm a theoretician by vocation. At least all my friends considered me that way. And then he added bitterly, It's bad when the theorist assumes a mission unusual for him. You want to say that you badly commanded the Sixth Army? The verdict will be passed by history, but the fact that I am here already speaks volumes. However, I fulfilled my soldierly duty to the end. <laughs>